Hello, and welcome to the American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference pre-conference broadcast series on One Concept Radio. I'm Felicia Brown, and I'll be your host for this interview and series. This is one of several broadcasts with the presenters and experts who are appearing in San Diego, California, April 20th through 22nd, 2012, and who are brought to you by One Concept. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the 2012 American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference sponsors, Massage Warehouse Scripps, MPA Media, H.J. Ross, ABMP, and Massage Envy Careers for making this year's event possible. Our special guest today is Whitney Lowe. Whitney and I will be talking about his three-hour class, Using Assessment to Boost Your Treatments. But first, let me tell you a little about Whitney. Whitney Lowe has been a massage professional for over 20 years. He is the author of Orthopedic Assessment in Massage Therapy and Orthopedic Massage Theory and Technique. Whitney also offers advanced clinical massage training via hands-on workshops, books, and DVDs, and produces one of the profession's most innovative online training programs. Whitney, welcome to the American Massage Chiropractic and Acupuncture Conference pre-conference broadcast series. As always, I'm excited to talk with you and today to learn more about your class using assessment to boost your treatments. Great. Thank you so much, Felicia. It's wonderful to talk with you again and always wonderful to work with the uh, staff here for the American Massage Conference and certainly looking forward to another exciting and innovative event coming up in April. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun and we're really um, glad to have you Uh, at this year's conference and, again, doing an interview today. Um, Before we get started, I know that you were one of the speakers at last year's inaugural conference in Atlanta. What made you want to come back and be a part of this year's event? Well, I think anybody that was at that event last year can just say uh, unequivocally it was a great event, and uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. You know, uh, it can get very tiring being on the road doing a lot of educational events throughout the year. And so uh, I really like to do those things that I think are going to be uh, both a great value for participants and a great experience for everybody involved. And this is certainly one of those. Um, I think it was a a wonderful event, the way it was structured, the way it kicked things off um, with this different format that they were doing with the conference and gave a great opportunity for all the participants there. So I was very excited to be uh, involved with the very first one and looking forward to an even better experience this coming spring in San Diego. It's going to be fantastic. I know there's tons of things going on at the conference. I will talk about some of them uh, at the end of the broadcast. There's a golf tournament and there's all kinds of special presentations and keynote speakers and tons and tons of classes. I'm curious as someone who does travel a lot and goes to a lot of conferences and events, do you have any suggestions for people listening on how they can make the most of a conference experience like this one? Well, I would say the conference experience is all about networking, communication, and just communicating with other practitioners out there. Some of the most interesting uh, interactions that I have had, um, and certainly not to discount the role of the educational events in the classroom, but a lot of times some of those interesting things happen just from chance meetings or people that you've been following on Facebook or Twitter for months or years and have really admired them and you see them in the hallway and you get to have a conversation with them or some conversation gets struck up at, at dinner or lunch about a certain topic. Sometimes those informal things are easily worth the conference entrance fee in and of itself, and not to mention all the great educational events that are happening on top of that. So if I'm hearing you correctly, then you're saying make sure to make time for that in-between time, those events after hours, the dinners and lunches. Don't just go hole up in your room or hide out, but be a part of the whole conference. That's right, because, I mean, half the experience is all the things that happen with these people when you're just getting to be with them in other environments and other situations. So it's a great part of the conference itself, in addition to all the formal structured events that are there. And, you know, what I've found about the conferences put on by this group in particular is that all the presenters are very accessible. Everybody that's there really seems to want to give of their time and have conversations with the attendees and um, get to know people on a personal level and not just as the instructor in a class. And I think that really is special. 
uh, it's a really great chance to connect with those mentors that you follow everywhere else, you know, to actually get to see them up close and personal and find out they're human. <laughs> right. um, and maybe a little bit of fun. So That's right, yeah. Well, it's going to be a great, you know? a great event. And uh, I know that you and I have, have had a great, we had a great time in Atlanta, and um, this is going to be no exception. Yeah, I think it will be wonderful just like that and even better, as I said. Well, you know, Whitney, talking about your class, I hear a lot of people talking about assessment these days. And, in fact, some of the other big names out there in massage and chiropractic uh, education, people that I've had a chance to interview in this program also, like Eric Dalton and James Wozlowski, they actually credit you as being the master of assessment. So I'm sure that you're going to be able to tell everyone why exactly is assessment so important in your practice. Well, you know, this is something that I have been sort of pounding the drum about for over 20 years now, about being very important in our practice. And just as a sort of a a brief little story about this of when this really made sense to me, I um, was very early in my massage practice, I don't know, the first six months in practice, I think, and had opened up my clinical practice in a medical office building. Uh, and, you know, trying to get referrals from doctors and things like that, like they told us in massage school, a great way to network with other health professionals. And one day this doctor in the building sent a woman to me who was having excruciating back pain, and she came in the door, and uh, after talking with her and going through a little bit of initial history with her, I realized I had no idea what was wrong with her. And (laughs) this doctor had just sent her to me. And, you know, I was not prepared for this. What we learned in massage school was, you know, if your client has something that you don't know what it is or don't know what to deal with, then send them to the doctor. But the doctor just sent this person to me. And that's when I realized that um, it was far more about uh, not just accumulating a large group of techniques to do for treating somebody, but you have to be able to figure out what's wrong with them. And that's really at the crux of what assessment is. I mean, you would not take your car to a mechanic and somebody who just said, hey, I know a bunch of, I got a bunch of wrenches and screwdrivers and things like that. I bet I can <laughs> fix your brake. You uh, want them to know what's going on and to know how to figure it out. And that's uh, essentially what this is all about is that this is one of the things that's just not taught very well in massage school is, you know, how to in fact figure out the nature of your client's problem. And I am adamantly on this mission to change that aspect of education in our field because I think we, in order to be as effective as we can be with people, we have to spend time figuring out what is the nature of their complaint. You know, your example about the wrenches, that is just absolutely hilarious. I had not thought about it in that way before, but you're absolutely right. Just because someone has a whole lot of tools in their toolbox doesn't mean they know how to use them or um, that they even know what the problem is to begin with. They could just start taking things That's apart, right. but they don't get to the root of the problem because they don't know what it is. Yeah, and that's, you know, interestingly, when I first got out of massage school, um, this was back in the late 80s. The area where I was living in Atlanta was sort of a crossroads for some of the biggest name people in continuing education uh, that were coming through there on a regular basis, Paul St. John and Judith Delaney and Benny Vaughn, and all these wonderful educators, and I was uh, taking as many of these technique courses as I could to learn as much from these great teachers as I could, but it was Benny Vaughn who really was the first person who said this to me and really sort of got me to realize that if you don't have an idea what the nature of your client's complaint is, um, you might be ineffective with them, but you could actually hurt them, and I had not really thought about that in that same kind of context and yeah you really do need to know what you're doing because massage is not benign there are ways in which it can in fact hurt somebody and so in order to be really the most effective and to be a safe practitioner if you're dealing with impaired health conditions or pain and injury complaints you've got to do some type of assessment and figure out what the nature of the client's complaint is most definitely now I know that there are a number of people listening that are massage practitioners who have heard through their instructors and other um, professionals that they are not to diagnose because it's out of their scope of practice. So I think it's really important 
for you to un for you to um, help explain the difference between diagnosing and assessing. Can you do that for me? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question because it's one of the most fundamental important distinctions that needs to be made about what assessment is and where that line is because what has happened is that by people being told so frequently in massage school we don't diagnose it has also scared many people away from doing any type of evaluation procedures to figure things out with their client the big distinction is that diagnosis is the assigning of a name or a label to a particular group of signs or symptoms so when a client comes in and they say, oh, yeah, I've got this pain around my elbow and it hurts when I do this particular motion, so and so, and you tell them, well, you've got tennis elbow, you have then given them a diagnosis by naming and labeling a particular pathology and telling that to them that that's what they have. But the process assessment is really a systematic process of gathering information where you're trying to determine the nature of a pathology. And again, because of legal requirements that massage therapists are not allowed to legally diagnose, that doesn't mean that you don't go through the process of trying to figure out what's the nature of your client's pathology. It just means you don't give them a pronounced diagnostic term and name for what that particular pathology is. But it's absolutely essential that you go through that process and figure out as much as you can about it what it is so, for example, if they've got something that might be, there's instances where massage therapists have used assessment skills and identified some very serious, uh, in some cases, life-threatening conditions that clients had that would not have been identified if they did not go through some form of assessment evaluation process. So it's absolutely essential that we do that with clients if we're treating them for pain and injury complaints. In a sense, it, it reminds me of the difference between prescribing, um, like telling someone they must do something and suggesting, uh, and in particular recommending of a number of treatments, let's say, that a person should come in for a massage. I run into that a lot yeah. with people in, uh, believe it or not, in my marketing programs where they say, oh, well, we're not allowed to tell clients how often they should come in. And again, this is speaking to the massage community. It's not so much that way with acupuncture or chiropractic, but um, say, oh, we're not allowed to do that. And, well, there are certain guidelines about what you are allowed to suggest, but certainly what you do, <laughs> the actual techniques and, and modalities that you are licensed to practice, you absolutely can recommend that a client come back within a week to continue their treatment. And that's not the same as prescribing Advil for them to go home and take. So it's yeah. kind of similar I guess. Yeah, it is similar. And, you know, the, one of the other things is that, you know, people often get into this place of feeling, well, my client wants to know what they have. And, yes, I completely understand that. And you can tell your client, it is not within my legal scope of practice to give you a diagnosis for what you have. But there is significant evidence to support the idea that you have a soft tissue problem that can benefit from massage. And you can tell them that. There's no reason you can't tell them that. And in your mind, you may be thinking, I am pretty darn certain this person has a piriformis syndrome, but you're not going to tell them those particular words in that particular phraseology that you're going to say, there are some possible indications that you might have a soft tissue problem, and it may involve some nerve entrapment. So we're going to address this with massage in the most effective ways that we can. I'm curious, Whitney, I don't know if you've heard stories about this type of thing or if it's happened to you where a patient has come to you and said, my doctor has diagnosed me with X, and um, so they wanted me to come and get massage for it. And so you go through your assessment um, regimen or routine and find out that actually they probably have something completely different. Your assessment points you in a different direction. Have you had anything like that happen? Oh, yes, dozens of times. And this is one of those situations where this gets back to us also understanding the perspective of how education evolves in the numerous health professions. For example, um, physicians in general um, may not be looking at soft tissue pathologies the same way a massage therapist is because they're looking through a very different lens at that pathology. Their primary tools of treatment are drugs and surgery. And if you look up some of the information about what's in the curriculum of medical schools, you'd be very surprised to learn how little many physicians um, 
have emphasis on musculoskeletal disorder in their general practice medicine training. And the same thing is true of massage therapists. We don't have that same kind of emphasis, but our focus is predominantly on musculoskeletal problems. So, for example, um, many people may not be looking at myofascial trigger points as a trigger point disorder. They look at for it to be something that is uh, an inflammatory condition that would be treated with anti-inflammatory medication. And we all have a lens, what I call a lens of bias that we look through. That is the way in which we tend to orient and focus our attention on something because of the way we've been trained to think about it. So, yes, this can put you in a sticky position sometimes of seeing something that really appears to be the case with something when it really does not, uh, the evidence doesn't support it. And I'm a big advocate for having adequate evidence to support a hypothesis. So in the treatment notes when that happens, you know, I'll document the things that are uh, consistent with that particular diagnosis or inconsistent with it and say, based on these findings that are inconsistent with this diagnosis, maybe we should reevaluate. And that's not saying necessarily that the um, previous diagnosis is an error, just saying maybe we should rethink these things because sometimes this occurs because a massage therapist is able to do certain things in the evaluation process that another health professional is not because we have the most um, refined palpation skills of soft tissue practitioners of almost anybody out there in many cases because we spend more time palpating soft tissue than any other health professional does. You know, I, I was at a conference where I talked with, or there was someone giving a talk on massage therapists as um, primary uh, health care providers for that very reason, because they have their hands on almost every part of a person's body. They have the opportunity to see them. They have the chance to be alone with them for generally, you know, somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half at a time. They have a relationship, you know, all the communication and so on. And, um, th you know, I think in a lot of cases they are trained to listen instead of to speak a lot. You know, we're supposed yeah. to just listen uh listen and not diagnose, not give advice, et cetera. So I think it's a really interesting premise, and it, in a sense it seems like it, it fits in with what you're talking about with the palpation and being able to maybe uncover something that another practitioner might have missed. Yes, and another point that's tying in with what you're saying there, too, is that one of the things that, you know, you're absolutely right about this in terms of the roles that massage therapists play in being in that kind of individual environment with each client but what we don't have and what we're not trained in in our, our educational programs is the clinical reasoning processes of thinking through and analyzing and breaking down these problems. And that's what assessment is all about, is really picking up clues, picking up pieces of information, putting them together and saying, does this pattern make sense? Does a person has, you know, pain with this motion and no pain with that motion and it hurts when they lay on their side this way but not that way? These are all aspects of clinical reasoning and critical thinking skills that's not about a technique. It's not about, um, can, you know, which new uh, technique you're learning, but it's can you think through and solve problems when they're presented with you to you in the clinical environment. And that's where we really need to boost up our educational skills in our training programs in this area because it's where we are really deficient in training people for that kind of uh, analytical processes. Well, thank goodness we have you to teach us all. <laughs> Hopefully everyone yeah, will, got... will take your classes. You really, I mean, as I say, a master and so master of assessment. You have to tell me now, what are the best assessment techniques to use? I'm sure there's lots of them, but what do you, what do you think are the best ones? Excessive use of the craniopolis muscle, I would say. <laughs> and uh -huh. this gets back to this thing. It's not so much about technique. It's about critical thinking. Like, can you, uh, for example, this has been demonstrated in orthopedic research over and over again that the most uh, uh, important aspect of the examination process is the history. They've done studies and found like close to 75% of the time a physician can arrive at an accurate diagnosis just with a well-taken history. And the emphasis there is on well-taken history because many don't take a good history. Um, if you take the time to really explore in detail with a practitioner, with your client, the nature of that complaint, 
uh, you can get a great deal of information just from the history if you know how to um, figure out the nature of what they're saying uh, in terms of the responses and what those responses mean. And then after that, I would say the next most important thing that is technique-wise is the ability to perform active and passive range of motion tests and manual resistive tests. But, you know, a lot, most everybody learned that in school. What they didn't learn was how to interpret what they, what they mean. Like, if my pain, if my client has pain with active abduction of their elbow, but not, or of their shoulder, but not passive abduction, what does that mean? And this is again, uh, an analytical process of comparing results and findings and gathering clues and being able to decipher those clues and determine what they mean to make uh, uh, the best guess about the nature of a soft tissue pathology. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm thinking about uh, some injury that I had, <clears throat> and I ended up somehow or another uh, on a table of someone who was um, really skilled in orthopedic massage. And where how he got to the the root of the problem was through the muscle testing and going around and, you know, the resistance and all of that. And once he went through that, he was able to hone in on the spot that was causing the problem. And I walked out pain-free with my jaw on the floor <laughs> because I thought, yeah. wow, he really got exactly to the problem and knew exactly what he was doing just from doing that testing. And, I mean, yeah. I'll be honest, well, I'm not skilled at that. Um, in terms of that assessment. And I thought then, and I think again now as I'm listening, hmm, I really need to get some brush-up training on that because I could see how exactly important it was in in my own body. Yeah. And, you know, and for me, a lot of that was developed um, working in an orthopedic and physical therapy clinic where I had patients only scheduled on the half hour, and they were every half hour, and that's a a very quick get in, interview, treat, turn around, get them out in a half an hour, which is not our typical massage environment. But I'll tell you what, it makes you pretty darn efficient in getting to the nature of that problem and identifying it and getting treatment done and getting them out of there to be able to really hone in on what is the key thing that needs to be addressed and how how to work with it. So that kind of environment really pushed me to help develop some of the systems, approaches, and methods of assessment that I have found to be most effective in a standard massage environment where we're seeing clients for over an hour or all that kind of time. But now, if somebody doesn't really work with medical or pain conditions, um, such as you would in an orthopedic clinic, I mean, do they really need to learn assessment skills? I would say in that instance, it's not imperative that somebody learn assessment to any great detail. But you cannot do massage without doing assessment because as soon as you put your hands on somebody and make some determination of what you're going to do and why you're doing it, like even if you're just saying, oh, this person's really stressed out, I think they would really benefit from just some great soothing myofascial release. That is assessment. So assessment is a process of gathering information and making decisions about what you're doing. So we all do it. It's just a matter of how much detail you go into. So I would say absolutely. If you're not going to be working extensively with people who have pain and injury conditions, you don't probably need the extensive skill set of really being a a master of of how to use all those uh, orthopedic tests and the active and passing uh, range of motion testing and all that kind of stuff. But you will still use assessment in your practice. And the other thing is I speak to many people who might work in what would be considered non-medical environments, like in a spa or something like that. And they will routinely tell me of situations where people came in and said, oh, yeah, I just want a nice relaxation massage. And they get in the middle of it and say, oh, man, you know, I've got this thing in my neck that's really been bothering me or this thing in my foot or my wrist or whatever it is. And they want you to try to do something about it. And you're in the midst of another session there. And now you're faced with the prospect of, well, I wasn't planning on learning anything about assessment, but now if you know something about this, you can really help that person much more effectively. Well, and you were talking earlier about how physicians can really make a good diagnosis if they've taken a thorough history. So I'm guessing that part of the assessment is also that dialogue with your patient or client. It's not just um, hands-on palpation or muscle testing uh, or anything like that. It, it's also 
of part of it's verbal. Absolutely, and it's uh, the the verbal part is crucial. I mean, I have been baffled, bewildered, and befuddled, so to speak, of the number of times that I have gone into massage therapists and said I had some kind of pain or injury complaint and had an interview that was over in two minutes that basically were like, okay, where does it hurt? All right, now get prone on the treatment table. And I'm sitting around waiting for them to, to sort of figure out, well, like, might I have a tumor in my spine? You know, might I have uh, you know, a severe injury that needs to be referred to somebody else? How, how are we going to just launch into this? And, and uh, it's just, you know, you need to go a lot further than that. And the history and the, the communicative process with the client is not only important for the assessment process, but this has been demonstrated over and over again in psychology research that it's not about the techniques that a, psycho a psychologist or psychotherapist uses. It's about their relationship with their patient. And that's, again, where it's all about the interaction between you and that individual that makes the healing process most effective. Right. And, you know, another presenter at the conference, um, David Kent, and I have talked about this in his interview recently where, um, you know, when you do these things, these assessments, you do the testing and you maybe do some postural analysis and you really ask good questions, not only are you better, a better able to give a good session or treatment, but you're also helping that client or patient to trust you, to see you as a professional and to realize that you know what you're doing. And it, so there's a, I think, a measure of help there um, in giving – getting their confidence and their trust because they're going to be better able to receive the type of work you're doing, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, and that that is not to be underestimated. It is one of the most powerful aspects of the healing relationship that you have with that client is their capability uh, and ability to trust what you're doing and trust your judgment, who you are and who you are being with them. That is absolutely essential. So now, Whitney, how exactly can practitioners learn more about assessment and become better at it? You know, it's like anything else. That The more you practice it, the better you will get at it. And the thing that I like to try to encourage people is think about yourself as the detective. You are gathering clues and you're trying to piece together information and determine when do you have enough information to make the leap to catch your criminal. And in this instance, your criminal is, of course, what is the nature of their pathology? It's all about uh, practice and becoming more aware and informed about different types of pathologies that might exist. I encourage people as much as possible, learn about other soft tissue disorders because the more you know about different soft tissue disorders, the more it will shape your interview and history taking capabilities to know the kind of questions to ask and the type of inquiry to pursue with those clients. So, Learning more about different pathologies greatly enhances your capability to use those very good interview and evaluation skills in the history-taking process. And then whenever possible, do as many uh, evaluation and assessment sessions with your clients as you can and see if it reinforces your hypothesis that you initially had about what the nature of their complaint was. I'm curious, Whitney, would you, if you're already in the process of treating someone, um, would you go back and do assessment um, throughout the treatment, like each session, or would you, is it something that you just start with at the beginning and then maybe test again at the end of a, a treatment series? How does that, how do you handle that? Clearly, the most comprehensive assessment occurs in the initial intake when you're with them and trying to determine what the nature of the problem was. But because assessment is a process of gathering information and you're trying to determine if they are getting better, then yes, absolutely, I will do a lot of just very brief assessment things each time I see somebody and judge, are we getting better, are we getting worse? And it's that method of um, trying to make that determination of are we on the right course here or do we need to change and change tack and change direction that is uh, we're able to do that just by even a very few a couple of quick assessment and evaluation procedures that will take less than 30 seconds. So it doesn't have to be something really time consuming in the interim time period, but it's a great way to measure and document your progress and your success. Right, and that's important for you as a practitioner as well as your patient or client so that they know they're improving too and they can actually see 
the difference between what it, what things were like the first time they came in versus the third session or the fifth session or what have you. Yeah, and you think about it. Think about conditions that are very difficult and take a long time to get over, something like uh, adhesive capsulitis, which is um, more commonly referred to as frozen shoulder. It's routine for somebody to have this condition for, you know, uh, six months, eight months, uh, a year even, or sometimes even as long as 18 months. So progress can be very slow sometimes with a condition like that. So if you're doing assessment, you've got an assessment technique that can measure range of motion accurately, you can really get that person motivated because they gained, you know, two centimeters in their range of motion this week. And that's good because they're trying to gain more improvement each time. And it's going to be slow and it's going to be gradual, but that gives them a stepping stone to know they're really making progress and working in the right direction. Excellent. Um, I know that there are some people who are not going to be able to make it to your class, and I'm wondering if you have any recommendations or suggestions for, for them, or really for everyone listening, um, in terms of improving your practice and client outcomes through assessment, something that they could um, put into action with their next client. Yeah, I would say kind of back to what I was saying a moment ago, that sometimes people are hesitant to get started doing assessment because they don't feel like they know enough. And my encouragement is just, just start doing it. Just start doing the basic fundamental things, and you will get better at it. It's like it's like learning a foreign language. When you first get started with it, it's all gobbledygook, and you can't understand any of it. But the more you hear that word, the more you hear that phrase, the more it becomes familiar. You've seen that pattern before. Oh, I remember that other client that I had that when you did this with their leg and their back, you know, they had the same kind of thing, and, and this is what worked with me to get them better. Does this make sense here in this particular situation once again? So it's just a matter really of practicing these concepts, practicing those methods, and, and making sure that, they, that you've got a good rationale for the treatment decisions that you're making because the assessment always needs to drive your treatment. Anything that you're doing in your treatment should be based on some type of rationale or reason that there's a, there's a good physiological reason to do this particular technique or approach with your assessment processes. So if you begin thinking like that, it greatly enhances your skill in using the assessment practicality or practically with your clients. Most definitely. I couldn't agree more. And I know I've, I've added little things in with my own assessment. I have really seen a shift in the way my uh, my uh, clients respond and the techniques that I use instead of saying, oh, well, you know, Joe just wants to do the same old, same old, even though he's got this complaint. If I really listen to what he's saying and, and do a little bit of, as you say, critical thinking uh, before the treatment, then I'm, I can arrange things for that session to be as effective as possible. That's right, yeah. So, Whitney, um, until we all meet in San Diego, I know some people are going to want to learn more about you and uh, attend other classes that you have, your online education, perhaps get your books or DVDs. Can you please share your website and contact information again so they can do so? Yes, absolutely. Uh, any of this information, you can find out about our courses, training programs, and other educational resources on our website at omeri.com, and that's O-M-E-R-I.com. And uh, that's the best place to kind of have a central location to figure out what kind of things might be your next best helpful tools for you. Excellent. I know a lot of people listening do want to come to the conference and sign up for your class, so I'm going to take a moment now to let everyone know how they can do that. The American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference is one of the largest exhibitions of massage, chiropractic, and acupuncture products continuing education, and business opportunities for practitioners of all disciplines. This year's conference will feature over 100 exhibitors, continuing education classes of one-hour, three-hour, and one-day workshops, including Whitney's classes. Other events during the weekend include a free keynote presentation sponsored by ABMP with Dean Juhan, the author of Job's Body, a charity golf tournament benefiting the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and the One Concept Gala and Dinner Dance. The registration cost for the general conference is just $40, which includes admission to the trade halls and all one-hour presentations, participations in raffles and giveaways of literally thousands of dollars in prizes, between-class coffee breaks, and loaded goodie bags. 
Attendees will also have access to many special offers and promotions from the conference exhibitors, as well as the chance to have a fantastic time with friends and colleagues. For students, the conference offers a free student day and Smart from the Start program on Friday, which is sponsored by Massage Warehouse Script and Performance Health. This day is dedicated to massage, chiropractic, and acupuncture students who are currently enrolled in school or who will graduate in 2012 and includes a free gift bag for the first 350 people. Also on Friday, all attendees are invited to attend a special presentation, Disciplines Unite, from 12 until 2, and the One Concept Job Fair from 2, from 2 until 4 p.m. All of this is happening at the Conference Hotel. That's the Town and Country Resort and Conference Center, and I definitely suggest you make plans to stay there if possible. Single or double rates are just $125 a night, but space is limited, so make your reservations today. Also, MPA Media is printing the American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference event program inside all three of their magazines, Massage Today, Acupuncture Today, and Dynamic Chiropractic. These will be given out at the conference and distributed throughout the U.S. to over 133,000 practitioners. So if you are a vendor or an educator who's listening in today and you'd like to get some great exposure for your products or classes, please contact Sandy Pierce of MPA Media for details on being a part of the conference program. Now, if you're ready to register for the 2012 American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference in San Diego, and of course to meet Whitney, myself, and the other amazing instructors, there are now two ways to do so. First, you can register online and pick your courses instantly on the official conference websites at AmericanMassageConference.com, AmericanAcupuncturConference.com, or AmericanChiropracticConference.com, depending on your discipline. You can also register by phone. The call is free and operators are waiting to talk to you at 877-674-3504. That's 877-674-3504. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash American Massage Conference, American Chiropractic Conference, and American Acupuncture Conference. Again, the 2012 American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference is made possible by all of our wonderful sponsors. Thank you so much to Massage Warehouse Script, MPA Media, H.J. Ross, HGBMP, and Massage Envy Careers. I hope after today's broadcast, everyone listening is ready to come to the conference and register for this three-hour class on Using Assessment to Boost Your Treatments with Whitney Lowe. Whitney, thank you again for taking the time to be with me today and for choosing to be a part of the 2012 American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acu Acupuncture Conference. We're really excited to have you at this year's event, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. And thank you again so much, Felicia. It was wonderful talking with you today, as always, and so wonderful to walk, work with this group again. I will look forward to uh, seeing all of them and all the participants down in uh, San Diego in April. Wonderful. This is Felicia Brown, and on behalf of everyone from the American Massage, Chiropractic, and Acupuncture Conference and One Concept Radio, I want to thank you for tuning in to this edition of the pre-conference broadcast series. Please remember to tune in each week through April 16th for more interviews and to visit our websites and Facebook pages for replays of all the interviews in this series. We look forward to seeing you in San Diego in April. Please also consider joining us for the Canadian Massage Conference, November 2nd through 4th in Burlington, Ontario, Canada. Thanks again for tuning in, and have a fabulous day.